And it's nice to see so many guests outside of the, the enrolled students. Um, I'm just going to say welcome and then I'm going to turn it over to Nora who's going to introduce our guest. But what we're going to do today, and we're, we're probably going to ask you to come a little closer and fill in some of these spots here. We do expect our guests to come, but they'll slide in the side. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to have our, our guest speaker, Tanya, start us off. She'll be with us for about a, an hour and ten minutes, um, answer some really good questions that you ask. So this is a really good opportunity. We know there are people in the room who've heard Tanya speak before who want to be here just for her. She's really phenomenal. Um, and then we're actually going to move directly into our Action Lab after, and then we'll take a break after that. So we're just going to ask you to kind of power through with us. We'll spend the last part of class um, reflecting on some of the themes in the class, but then giving you some time in, in your uh, book club so we can end a little early if we're super efficient. Sounds good, right? Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Nora to introduce our speaker. Good evening. It's my pleasure to get to introduce our speaker for tonight, Tanya. Tanya, I apologize. As a community leader and activist, Tanya Watkins is the executive director, lead organizer for Soul, Southsiders Organized for Unity and Liberation. Soul helps low-income people of color build and leverage power for their communities. As a mother, writer, and community organizer, Tanya is Tanya's is a strong and effective voice for police reform. So please join me in welcoming her tonight. this was saying number one I'm a writer so I write number two I'm a cursor so I write <laughs> right. structural violence is one way of describing social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way the arrangements are structural because they are embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world. They are violent because they are an injury to people. Neither the culture nor pure individual will is at fault. Rather, historically given and often economically driven, processes and forces conspire to constrain individual agency. Structural violence is visited upon all those whose social status denies them access to the fruits of scientific and social progress. From Pathologies of Power by Paul Farmer. One hundred and eighty years of middle passage, two hundred and forty six years of slavery, rape and abuse, 100 years of illusionary freedom. Black codes, convict leasing, Jim Crow, all codified by our national institutions. Lynching, medical experimentation, redlining, disenfranchisement, grossly unequal treatment in almost every aspect of our society. Brutality at the hands of those charged with protecting and serving being undesirable strangers in the only land that we know. During the 385 years since the first of our ancestors were brought here against their will, we have barely had time to catch our collective breath. That we are here at all can be seen as a testament to our willpower, spiritual strength, and resilience. However, 385 years of physical, psychological, and spiritual torture have left their mark. That is from Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGruy. Who's read it? Read it, okay? My name is Tanya Watkins, and I'm the executive director of Southsiders Organized for Unity and Liberation, also known as SOUL, and the co-executive director of the Black Roots Alliance. I am not an academic, nor am I a researcher. I come to you with no empirical evidence 
and no statistical data from case studies. I am neither a historian or an educator. I'm a faith-based organizer, and I'm also a directly impacted poor black woman who has traveled from the south side of Chicago to stand as a living testimony about the impact of organizing and building power. In organizing, we believe that our personal stories are what connects us, and our shared narrative is what informs our analysis. But in order for you to understand my story of power, you must first understand my story of powerlessness. So do I have your permission to share a very personal story with you here today? Yes. You know I'm looking at you because you're right in front of me. Do I have your permission to share a personal yes. story with you today? I appreciate that. The first time I was ever in an emergency room, I was 16 years old. I discovered a strange and painful lump on my breast, and although my single, well-educated mother was working full-time as an accountant, her employer did not feel the need to provide her with health insurance. An all-too-familiar byproduct of being part of the working poor class in the 90s. Due to the lack of free or affordable health clinics in our area, and because we had no clue where to find one, we ended up in the emergency waiting room of Provident Hospital. Provident, founded by Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, had a rich history in Chicago, being one of the first black-owned, black-operated hospitals in the country. Once a pinnacle of black medical excellence, it had been forced to close its doors in 1987 and was reopened in 93 as part of Cook County's public hospital system. When we arrived, the room was packed, filled with black and brown faces, experiencing different levels of physical, psychological, and emotional trauma and illness. There were people bleeding, people hunched over, people moaning and crying, and other people who were displaced, seeking warm refuge from the Chicago cold. Some looked and sounded like they were close to death. Standing in the corner, I felt ashamed, not because I was so poor that I was at Providence, but because I felt that my ailment was nothing in comparison to what was happening around me. We stood and sat and stood again for more than four hours. With each passing hour, I begged my mother to go home. She lowered her head in response. We had no other options. By the fifth hour, security guard came to announce that the emergency room was overcrowded and that medical staff would be triaging folks in the waiting room. When it was finally my turn, a white man in blue scrubs kneeled in front of me. What's the problem, he barked. My breast, I whispered, embarrassed. Him, louder now. Your breast? Well, what's wrong with your breast? My shame filled the room as his voice echoed. I grounded my feet to the floor and clenched my teeth in an effort to hold back my 16-year-old tears. I found a lump on my breast. So you came to the emergency room for a lump on your breast. How is that an emergency, he said. My mother stepped in. It hurts her, and we don't have insurance. I didn't know where else to take her. He sighed and rolled his eyes. He took me over to the corner of the room and clumsily wheeled over a hospital curtain suspended on rods. He grabbed a chair and pulled up a seat. Lift up your shirt and bra, he ordered. I looked around nervously. I could see the faces of the waiting patients through the large gap between the curtain and the wall. I could feel the cold of the room running its nails up and down my spine. I could see the impatience of this white man who had been so inconvenienced by having to lay his hands on my fat, disgusting, poor, black body. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see my mother leaning on the wall, head bowed in her own shame, feeling powerless to protect her child in this moment. It was then I realized that I was a person in this country that was not afforded the luxury of basic human dignity because I was poor and I was black. 
My mind rushed back to the images I had seen of tortured black bodies not from history books, but in contemporary times, humiliated and threatened by police officers on the street. Two years earlier, the image of a black man flashing across my TV screen being beaten nearly to death by so-called peace officers as he gasped for air and pleaded for his life. All of this public violence and terrorism being sanctioned by the state that it pledged to serve and protect all. And I could never be so bold to compare that teenage experience to the disgrace of that countless experience of disgrace to that of the countless black women made to stand naked on the auction block during American chattel slavery, or to the utter terror of thousands of women of color who are incarcerated in the system, who are holed down and have their privacy part violated by prison guards. But what I know is this. I stood before a white man who was ordering me to expose myself because I felt that I had no other choice. And I lifted my shirt, closed my eyes, and wished myself to the furthest corner of the universe. And the rest I pushed as far out of my recollecting consciousness as I could. But the next thing I remember was being prescribed an antibiotic that we couldn't afford. So I lived quietly for the next four months with a throbbing and painful lump on my breast. I walked away unhealed and re-traumatized by yet another racist and classist system that had been charged with my care and protection. My story is just one of a growing collection of stories of how the system of health has participated in the marginalization of people of color, not only in Chicago, but all over the country. It is in no way a story of the past but the face of healthcare and poor communities of color all over the United States. What is happening in black communities should be considered a national travesty by organizers and health leaders alike. And waking up and beginning to have these delicate conversations about dismantling and rebuilding these systems to create a culture of health as it should be is critical in this moment. I organize to build power, to change the dominant narrative around all systems present in this country, and to impact legislation to deliver tangible, systemic change to communities most in need. But organizing and activism by directly impacted people also, although a necessary component in organizing to win, comes at a cost. Erica Garner was forced to relive the death of her father at the hands of police over and over again as she traveled the country, took to the streets, and fought tirelessly and selflessly for black liberation. Having never gotten a real chance to grieve the loss of her father or recover from the shock of losing him so violently and suddenly, she immediately turned to activism to ensure that we would not continue to lose people we love due to the actions of merciless killer cops. She was a warrior who had no other option but to move at the expense of her mind and body. And on December 23, 2017, Erica Garner fell into a coma after suffering an asthma attack that triggered a heart attack. She died at Wood Hill Medical and Mental Health Center in Brooklyn on December 30, 2017. She was only 27 years old. Marshawn McCarroll was a well-known Black Lives Matter activist from Columbus, Ohio. Marshawn organized against the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson and worked to aid the homeless. He launched the program Feed the Streets after he himself was homeless for three months. A talented and prolific spoken word artist and student, he organized massive demonstrations in Ohio that inspired direct actions across the country. On February 8, 2016, Marshawn McCarroll shot himself to death at the entrance of the Ohio State House in Columbus. Hours before he shot himself, Marshawn wrote on Facebook, my demons won today. I'm sorry. He was only 23 years old. At 41, despite this work, 
I've somehow passed the life expectancy of many of my peers and colleagues. Came here today not only because I'm an organizer, but I'm also a mother. And if you were to look in my daughter's eyes, I hope that you would see her beauty, her youthful energy, and her innocence. But I need you to know that the system continues to label her as poor and black. She has experienced more generational trauma than any sweet 13-year-old child should be expected to endure. She fears for her life. She worries more than she should. And there is a possibility she will walk into her adult years with a fight on her hands that she did not starve, nor does she deserve. She deserves health care. She deserves a mother to guide her. She deserves to be safe. She deserves a long and happy life. She deserves a life free of incarceration. She deserves reparations for every historical atrocity committed against her people. And she deserves liberation. She is the reason why I fight to build power. So, I am boldly here to face all of you as leaders in public health to ask, what are you willing to do to stand up to racism and classism in this country, in your work and in your life, to ensure that my daughter and every child of color lives in the world as it should be? What can health professionals do in order not to be complicit bystanders in the death of people of color organizers, their bases, and directly impacted people they serve across the country? How do we together as organizers, advocates, and academics, what can we do to ensure that the system of public and private health accessible to poor people doesn't become yet another polarizing, dehumanizing, oppressive system destined to be placed on the social justice chopping block as one worthy of dismantling? And how do we work collectively to ensure that communities build the power necessary to create trauma-informed, culturally-informed, community-driven responses to violence, health, and wellness that is affordable and accessible to all. So I'm open to questions, but you know a whole lot about me already. <laughs> but I'm more interested in your personal story. What are you building? What are you willing to risk to build that? Why are you here? I heard that this is like an elective, like you don't have to take this class. So everybody in this room chose to be here, right? And so, why? So they gave me like an hour and 10 minutes, <laughs> which means I could talk to everybody in this room if I really want. Well, the two of us, we came to see you, woman. You, you came to see me personally? Well, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. But tell me more about you. Mm. Mm. What does that feel like when somebody says that to me? Like you're lesser, like there's something wrong with you, like, you know. Who's heard that the idea of not being white means that you are lesser? There are people who have not heard that the idea of not being white means that you are lesser. And I ask you if you feel that way. Have you heard it on TV, on social media? Thanksgiving with your racist uncle. <laughs> right? Who else has heard things like that? How do you react to that? How does that feel when you hear that? Actually, not very surprised. Mm. So who are you? What's your name? Baby. Why are you here in this class? It's the best class. So who agrees it's the best class here in the school? <laughs> What do you want to take from this experience with these people? What do you feel like you need to act? Oh, <laughs> An hour and ten minutes! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the isms. So much. It's been going on for a long, long time. It's a lot more in your face right now. Why do you think that is? Not 
not like it's a big surprise that there are people out there who are racist and homophobic and sexist and everything else, but we're going to have a lot more comfortable speaking up now because they've been doing it. Not just speaking, but yeah. Who agrees that because of the president, I don't say it's because right. the reality is you the president. People say, not my president. Yes, he is. We all are president. But who thinks because of him racism is worse? Who thinks racism is the same? Why do you think it's, it's the same? Um, I, I think it's the same because it hasn't gotten any worse for me, but it hasn't gotten any better. And the reason why I'm here is because I don't feel like things can get better. Mm. I'm in that position now where I feel like this world is just going to get worse and worse and worse. And so I'm looking for, and searching for, and hoping for that, you know, that light that, you know, spark, that something mm -hmm. to get me out of that feeling because I see so much, and there's glimpses here and there of, you know, positivity, but those are so few and far between that, yeah, I just, I just feel like it's not going to get I'm going to come back to that. Um, I was just going to say that I feel like it hasn't I agree. That I feel like it's both. It hasn't really changed, but I feel like with this whole, um, this whole um, being um, elected has just exacerbated issues that was already um, just bad. It kind of gave people like white supremacy groups and like supporters more fuel to just you know be more out work with it now. So I just feel like a lot of things, like a lot of things that's just been happening since this whole presidency, it's like all oh, now people just don't really give a fuck no more. They just mm. say what they want. Like it was more kind of like low key, but now it's just all out there, all over the US. But, um, and I also feel like he set back a lot of policies that were put for, that was helping our communities like overturning those. So he set us back some a few years back. Like um, the other day, I just saw the article about trans people not being able to enter the army now. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things, like I mean, all the if you look at all the cuts that he's made to like Medicaid and Medicare, like just a lot of uh, a lot of programs that we need in place, like they just like because it's not their issues, like they just you know they're not going to be willing to invest in our community because they don't. It's like and then again, it's not a lot of people on the policy level like that look like those you got people that's have, uh, that's telling us what we need for our community mm. and they don't even know nothing about our community never been in that community so you have like i saw a on an article on facebook the other day like they had this whole group of like white politicians Talking, uh, talking about, about women still. Talking about our vagina. No, it was no women. Can nowhere. we say vagina in this class? It, yeah. was, no, it was no <laughs> women. Okay. It was no women in that meeting. Right. It was all white. Like it was all men. It was mm. all men. I was like, wow, this is like. like but y'all talking about women so Y'all don't have one woman here in this like committee. Like talking about women cell. I was just like, wow. Like it just like it was like really bad. Like it's just like laughing. I'm like wow, seriously, this is like a joke. Like it's just like a lot of things. It's just like it just is. It can be discouraging in a way too. But it also, I just feel like as a whole, we just have to do more and just not give up on those mm -hmm. things. Even though when things seem like it's, get, it's getting worse, we just have to you know continue to hold on to faith. That's real. That's real. Um, I see more of this community um, black community, and basically in black community now, we know uh, for the president say you could be charged, people not go to access to medical care, and people die for prevent, for if they can prevent, they can take medication for that protection or diabetes, but people now start, start not asking for that service, and uh, uh, and I see more people afraid, especially for the poorer, and 
and, um, and separation and families, and see more violence in the community mm -hmm. too, because I'm from Little Village and we constantly see young people die, yeah. and no programs. And I know they're not gonna put uh, money in, uh, in that community because uh, they don't they, they don't care about this kind of communities and not you know. So who agrees? You see it more. It's extended to more communities, right? Say that again. It says it's promoted. Mm. Is it the advent of social media? The growth of social media? The growth of media? Or is it just that it is emerging? So when Donald Trump was elected, I was actually in Portugal during the election. And I was there with, with three white women, which was weird. No offense, my mom. I know, like, you know. I was like, why do you keep washing your hair every day? And everyone in Portugal wanted to talk about the election in America. It was so weird. It was like people from all over the country at the summit. And they were like, what do you think about what's happening in the States? And I was just like, why does it matter to you? And I didn't realize how important American politics was globally until I was there. Because when I meet people from other countries, I don't ask them shit about their politics, right? Because as Americans, we feel like the only thing that matters is what's going on right here. That's really messed up. And it was also interesting to walk in a place and not be seen as black. People would just be like, oh, you're American. And I was like, that's <laughs> deep, right? <laughs> but everybody was saying, well, how do you feel when you feel it's going to happen? I was just like, but Donald Trump ain't going to there's no way in hell. Like, you know, he like a TV star who's like super racist and, and gross and doing all stuff. <laughs> Americans know better than that, right? So when the election happened, like, you know, there, when it's night, is day, and it's over there, what's that? Time zone? Uh, Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so when we woke up in the morning, when I woke up, the women that I was with, the women that I was with were sobbing. I mean, like audibly upset. And so I got up and I made me a bowl of Portuguese cereal and I'm just walking around and they're like, why are you not falling apart? And I had to look at them and say, as a black woman, my life was fucked up yesterday. And it's gonna be fucked up tomorrow. The only difference is now you feel threatened by the fact that your life may be fucked up too. And at that moment, now there are calls for deep-rooted solidarity. And as activists and organizers, that mind frame of until it directly impacts me, then I fight against it, is what we don't necessarily believe in. A threat, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Every fight for black liberation is also a fight for white women. It's also a fight for gay men. Because for, as a black woman, I truly believe that my liberation is deeply connected to the fact that everybody in this room thrives. And I don't organize from a place of hope or happiness, I organize, number one, out of love for my people and love for the people in this room and anger. Unfortunately, happiness breeds complacency. When you feel good, you don't do shit. Right? When you got everything you need, you don't ask for more. Well, you shouldn't unless you like fucked up capitalist people, right? But when you feel that your life is threatened, you react. And so that understanding that my kids cannot thrive is what pushes me to continue. Because when you truly feel hopelessness, you give up completely. You got up and you came to this class because you are looking for something. But as dope as all these people are, and as dope as I am, nobody can give you that something until you are fed the fuck up. 
And it is not your singular responsibility to impact systems. But we believe that power is two things. Somebody, somebody said, mm hmm what is it? What's power? Oops. Oh my gosh. They know they're just Y'all like in college. And I'm about to teach y'all something? He's looking at me like, you're about to teach me nothing. <laughs> we believe that power is organized people and organized people. Right? That's it. It's not influence. It's not magnificent riches. It ain't good looks. It is organized people and organized money. And as long as you are building that collectively, you are the most powerful person in the world. What's your name? David. David. You are the most powerful person in this world. David. You are the most powerful person in this world. Because of the work that you will do in this class and beyond. My daughter. You never met her, have you? You might have, but she would be on the internet. <laughs> Yeah. Viral videos. But because of you, my daughter will go to college. Because of you, my daughter will not have to be afraid to walk down the street. Because of you, when she is driving in a car, she won't have to worry about the police unloading dozens of bullets into her ride because her vehicle fit a description. That just happened on Tuesday. Because of you, no other person will have to have the impact of live with having their breast examined in a public waiting room because you are the most powerful person. How does that feel? That's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Who else do I want to meet? I kind of want to meet you. She gives me like this look, like, I don't want to talk to this lady. And that kind of draws me to people like, when I know that they don't want me to mess with them because there's something wrong with me. What's your name? I'm Charlie. Hi, Charlie. That's like a dope name. Charlie, why are you here? It's hot. Hot, Charlie. Anyway, you didn't care. I shared that with you because I trust you. Or you. Uh, I, I want to learn and learn about systems. Mm. How do you think that you might leave this course and make that? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think just knowing more gives you power to call things out and to, uh, you know, change the status quo. Yeah, and it's vague. But it's a little vague, yeah. but I think that it might be a start, right? <laughs> But hopefully somebody in this class can help you dig deeper to figure out, number one, what pisses you off. Number two, what do you love? And number three, what do you want to build? And number four, what are you risking to build that? Right? Who in this room can you have a conversation with about what that is? Somebody like literally volunteered. That's how invested this person is in you, Charlie. What's your name? My name's Laura. Laura yeah. is all about Charlie <laughs> and what Charlie was trying to build. So, Laura, when can you have that conversation with Charlie? Yeah, uh, after five. <laughs> By the end of next week. Uh, I don't know next week. Because I'll be back in a couple of weeks to check. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move over here. <laughs> you have this beautiful piece of art that's calling me, so blame that. All right. And also, like, you have this amazing smile, and you look like you're on the verge of something. So I'd like to know who you are and why you're here. Um, well, my name is Pat. It doesn't really tell you who I am. Um, but I'm here just to further my own understanding of these structural inequities and try to bring that back to my community, enhance the dialogues that I have, enhance my participation, my engagement with my community, and take it to the next level so that I can continue to step in and do something. So Pat, who do you consider your community? Right, well, um, frankly, <laughs> uh, if that's... 
I'm, I, I, the biological world at large, my community is this earth, mm. this, this mother earth, which is what I got right here. I mean, this is what it's all about. She gave us life, she gave us everything. Um, but more specifically, the community that I'm working with is Rogers Park. That, that is a very interesting and diverse community. Now, how do you, in what capacity are you working with? I, uh, well, a little bit less than I used to. I, for, for about a year, year and a half, I served on the board of directors for the Rogers Park Food Co-op. Mm. Looking to build an inclusive, uh, community-oriented, community-owned neighborhood that wants to identify and tackle the inequities in the food system more specifically. I'm a foodie as well, so a lot of my efforts mm -hmm. kind of focus around food. I believe in the community of food. It brings people together. Baby, me to too. It. I believe in the community. are speaking my language. Tell me more. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I just felt uh, that these conversations are getting trickier because these systems are getting more opaque. You know, it's not like people are throwing out white hoods and walking around like burning crosses. That's anymore. right. That's right. And I've uh, I found it increasingly difficult to engage with not necessarily like the overt racists. Like I don't know to, to what extent they're going to win too many of them over, but there's a lot of fence sitters in this country, yeah. and I've been looking hard these last couple of years for like how do you communicate with those people. Effectively. And I think part of it, I mean, part of it has nothing to do with this class. It just has to do with what is a human? What are our brains? How do they work? How do you engage with people at all in the first place? But then a big part of it has to do with learning in particular about these systems of injustice that we're talking about so you can bring that to the fore, hopefully in a way that engages with, uh, with your audience in a way that will resonate with them. We had a speaker last week, or two sessions ago, um, talking about uh, she, was, uh, she was Islamic. And she started a mosque downtown. Maria. Maria. Yeah. Maria Lynn, yeah. Um, and what was the line she had, which just like floored me? She was like, she wants the the Muslim community to be more inclusive for the LGBTQ community because she doesn't want anybody to be denied the truth that is Islam. Which is like it's one of those ways you to put something that it's just like anybody who who has faith will understand that. It doesn't matter what you think about LGBTQ. So I'm looking to try to just engage more effectively, more forcefully with the world at large. That's why I'm here. I think you and Charlie should have a conversation. <laughs> what up, Charlie? <laughs> First of all, I want to sign up for your course. Whatever it is, when you start coming up here and teaching folks how to do Hopefully things. Hopefully there's a book. Coming forth in the next well, you know what, sir? Yeah, let, me, let, me not, let me not damper your shine. I hope to come to your book signing one day. I hope you remember me. I think that something that you said, a lot of things that you said, very much so resonated with me. And I will actually take some of that back, besides the stuff about food. But when you talked about how racist systems, are now opaque, right? How they are not people that are running around in white hoods, right? And so it reminded me of something that happened, I think it was April 1st, it was April Fool's Day. So Kim Fox, you folks know who Kim Fox is, Cook County State's Attorney. On April 1st, the Fraternal Order of Police came to protest Kim Fox. Apparently they mad about Chelsea Smollett, right? <laughs> we know that's not why they're really mad, right? So they came in numbers. I'm an organizer. I've been in all types of protests, mobilizations, some mass, some small. I have to say that this was a lot of motherfucking people. They bust people in from mid from I think Indiana. New York, and we came to counter protest them. Because when the police say they're going to protest, I don't care what it is, we're going to show up and fuck with you, right? <laughs> but we do absolutely support criminal justice reform. We do support deferred prosecution. I do believe that whatever Justice Smollett did, I am not safer in my home if this man is in jail for 20 years. That is not safe. Jussie Smollett ain't coming to get nobody in this room. As are many people who are sitting in jail right now because they are poor and black. 
So I'm okay with them letting him off. And I truly believe that there are more poor people of color sitting in prison that need to be let out. But I digress. What was, I'm gonna get to you, cause you burn, you like, I love when you give me amens, cause I was hoping that you would, I was worried. When you was eating whatever you was eating, I said, you gonna throw stuff at me. So as long as we here, it's a good day. But what I noticed when I was out there, and I actually, this is my first week back out, because last week I was in a very deep depression. Unlike anything I'd experienced in a very long time. I've been spit on by police. I've had corporate businessmen throw hot soup at me at direct actions. And I've been told every day, get a job! That's what I hear, get a job! And I'm like, if it's my job, it's about you, right? <laughs> But to stand there against the police, to hear them call Kim Fox a black bitch. This woman who has educated herself, who has gone through so much as a woman of color, to get to this position in order to serve every community. And they chanted, hey, hey, Ho, ho, Kim Fox is a ho. They are sending her death threats. And what was most shocking to me, that standing with the fraternal order of police, the white nationalist groups. And for some reason, that messed me up, y'all. Right? Because you hear us. Back up, back up, we want freedom, freedom, all these racist ass cops, we don't need them, need them. I have said that a million times. So one, one day I went with my friend because she lost her car and she wanted to find a police report, file a police report, and when I was in walking to the police station, that song started playing in my head. And I had to like convince myself not to yell it out loud. That's how much I have said that and I've heard it, right? And it is a narrative, but to see the police standing with actual racists, right? To see that with my own eyes, where it didn't become, a, a, it wasn't, I suspect they might be. And it wasn't like these white nationalist groups were just like on the outskirts and they were just like, get away from us, right? Because there's been time we've been in direct action. And, and people have come with the message that we don't mess with, and we make it clear, not only are you not with us, but you need to go home. There was none of that. This was a deep mixture of police and white nationalists to the point where I didn't know who was who. And that messed me up to my core. That helped me to understand, even as a black woman who knows it, who feels it, that it was absolutely undeniable. And standing with those cops, white nationalists, were city aldermen. And I'm looking at the press, right? And they're over there on our side, and we are small in numbers, and we are loud, and we're moving back and forth, and they're looking for some kind of fight to break out. Where's Jesse Jackson? Where's Jesse Jackson? while white nationalist organizations are right there, plain as can be. And who saw that on the news? When the fraternal order of police was actually confronted with the photos that these white nationalists are that were there, do you know what they said? No, they wasn't. I'm gonna repeat that. When they were confronted with photos of white nationalist groups saying that they were there, the fraternal order police said, no they wasn't. And guess what the press said? Oh, okay. So sometimes it's not as opaque as we think. 
but the people who are supposed to validate us, make us not believe our lying eyes, right? You are fighting for access to healthy, nutritious food in every community. But there are people who would argue with you and say, it absolutely already is. And do you believe that? Meaning, but I would like to build power with you so that instead of you just saying it by yourself, we're going to be saying it together. Right? And we're going to take charge. Right? <laughs> and we're going to build power. Does that sound dope? Or does it sound creepy because we just made it? <laughs> that sounds like the age of the internet right there. That's what that sounds like. Oh! <laughs> the age of the internet? People never met, get together, form a little power, try to change the world. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, but the only thing is, I gotta get off the internet and into the real life. The only thing is, the other side do that too. It's mm. just a tool. Like all tools. That's right. There. That's right. Like people think, like I've made a social media post, therefore I have warriored. And it's like, no, you right. have not. <laughs> you wanted to say something. Oh, oh I was just uh, gonna piggyback on this whole justice all of the people are upset about that. I mean, there's a lot of things we can be upset about. I mean, I'm upset that, you know, George Zinnemann got off, you know, with killing Trayvon Martin. But nobody Who else is upset about, about that? that? There's a lot of things. But this man ain't killed nobody or anything, regardless if it was a lie or not. He didn't hurt nobody. He didn't physically hurt anyone. He didn't kill anyone. The people are, I think people are more upset that a, another black man got off, um, you know, for something. It's a, so we're going to prosecute them to the fullest. It's like, you know, for black people, it's not like when we're going through the system, because I've had friends that's going through a situation right now, too, and she said something that really resonated with me that it's not black. Black people is, um, you know, how the saying goes, like, oh, you're. Um, you're innocent until proven guilty. No, you're guilty until you're proven innocent. Mm. So they're gonna take every extreme measures. I mean, if you look at everything as a whole, black people are, you know, they they serve longer sentences that we're in the system longer. We're at the, you know, it's us, it's black and brown people that are, you know, not getting that, you know, criminal justice that like for like for us like it just it's just not happening. That's right. So yeah, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> so Jason Van Dyke. He was the officer that murdered Laquan. How many years did he get in prison? Right. Six, right? Was six? So there is this amazing movement attorney named Sharon Mitchell who said that he actually defended, I think it was like a young man who had stolen like some candy bars or something, and he got a longer sentence than Jason Mann for a crime of survival. So that's that, that is, it's not, the thing is, people don't say like, you feel that way. We don't feel that way. It is actually what is taking place in our communities, which is a fundamentally flawed justice system, which is everybody's problem, right? right. The justice system that exists in Cook County should be fair and just for every single individual within that county. And if it is not, it is everybody's problem. So why ain't everybody doing something about it? Because in effect, I think individual people maybe feel powerless to create like community level change, like on their own. And I think that, uh, that I think that the value of like collective action it, with you know coalition building. Uh, is undervalued. Mm. And I think that um, in order to dismantle racist systems, you have to work collectively. Uh, yeah. Like I don't, I don't. <laughs> I could not have said that any better. Right. And what it looks like to people is sometimes like 
scary, right? Like when I use words like collective action, right, or mobilization, people go, oh, that thing where you march down the street and yell at people and then you get drug off to jail by the police. And I say, well, yeah, and people who create public policy, right? Folks who go to law school and then come out of law school and they get connected with organizations like the ACLU, right? Or the Chicago Council of Lawyers. There are places other than the ACLU that do amazing movement legal work, right? Or they make a decision to like throw the fuck down in the public defender's office, right? There are people who do research. Like, I believe that police officers are some of the largest contributors to political campaigns, either collectively or individually. Who here is smart enough to research that? Is somebody. Thank you. Everybody was like, not me. I know y'all are. Don't play with me. Right? And so figuring the, those things out, how do we fix it? Maybe we get the money out of politics. So nobody has that kind of financial power over elected officials, right? Who does that work? What does that actually look like? What does that mean? Does it mean democracy vouchers? Does it mean small donor matching? Does it mean no, nobody can take a political contribution? That does not require you going to jail. And that is a way of building collective power. What did you say? What's your name? I forgot to ask you your name. Um, yeah, oh, what's your name too? Javante. Javante. And what's your name? Kat. Kat. What did you say about building collective power? I just said like in order to dismantle racism, racist systems, um, you have to build like collective action for like right. coalition building. That's right. Really familiar with back home classes. What's your name? Abby. And why are you here? Um, well, it's just like when I was in undergrad, I took a class on sociology and I've done a lot of like not just racism specifically, but the whole race issue. And I learned a lot from that. And So what do you want to be? Like, don't worry about what people tell you. What do you want to be? What do you? What's the world that you want to live in? That that would excite me. Um, I'm serious. I know people people ask me that. Like, why are you asking me that? Because let's build that shit. Who said we can't have it? What do you want to build? where like people don't have to be afraid walking down the street due to their color their skin or just like because they're holding hands with somebody of the same gender as them. Who else would like to build that? <laughs> you got like a army <laughs> like ready to throw down with you. Who would be down with helping Abby build that? I'm sorry, you lost the title. Abby is now the most powerful person in the room. <laughs> How does that feel knowing that there are people who are willing to build that world? That's a lot. Feels good. Feels empowered. Feels good. Feels good. Possible. Yeah. Who would be willing to donate one dollar to what Abby wants to build? How many people in the room about? About two, three thousand? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a lot of money. You have a lot of people and a lot of money who believe in your vision. Right? And so sometimes that's part of building collective power. Just being brave enough to say what you want to build. I want to build a world without prisons. I'm an abolitionist. 
And when I say that, people get like really super scared. They expect me to like walk in with like a beret and like, you know, like a big old gun, you know. But I am a prison abolitionist. And what that means for me is I do not believe that the world gets better due to cages. Incarceration and policing in this country is supernatural. It is unreal that we invest more and more money into something that has proven to be historically ineffective. The prison industrial complex has grown exponentially, and so has crime together. Chicago's getting worse. Well, instead of this many cops, we need way more. Who does that? Rom, Rom, <laughs> yes, Rom does that, right? I always want you to, yeah. and Lori, the Lori loves the cops too. Woo! So. I didn't say it. <laughs> Somebody said it. <laughs> right? My doctor prescribed me a weight loss drug that made me gain weight. Would I go to him and be like, could you double my prescription? Right. Does that sound stupid? Who want to be a nurse <laughs> or a doctor? Does that sound stupid? Yes. Is that like medically ridiculous to take anything ineffective and to put more of it into anything? And that is what we do with policing and incarceration. Now, people say, so what you want to do? Just open the doors and just let all the people out? That is what they, he's like, yeah, why not? <laughs> and that is real. But in addition to that analysis that cages don't keep us safe, has to be an analysis that happens concurrently around what does, right? What does keep us safe? Close your eyes, do this exercise. I'm not gonna, do anything to you, ma'am. It's okay. Close your eyes. <laughs> How much time? Uh, I want you to envision a world, or envision a time when you felt the most safe. Any moment in your life where you felt the safest. And when you have that particular moment, I want you to open your eyes. And just begin to shout out what you had in that moment that made you say. You had family. What else? A home. You had a home. What else? I was out of the country. You were out of the country? <laughs> we don't have enough time to unpack that. <laughs> what else? So what do you what did you have there that made you feel safe? Um, I I was in um, Singapore and I learned in my research to go over there I learned all about their laws and their ways of policing mm -hmm. and how effective it is and how unintrusive it See you jumping ahead <laughs> <laughs> You just go you don't take over my presentation <laughs> No one's going what else? Who had food in their vision? Yeah. Of course me. <laughs> me and you, we always got food. I don't know how you stay like that and not get like this. <laughs> right? What else did we have? Laughter. We had laughter. Was anybody sick in their vision? You were healthy. You were sick in your vision? I, I was very, very sick with food poisoning. Oh. But I was very and felt safe because too much information. But I had a toilet. You had a toilet. <laughs> so you had access to plumbing. I had a toilet. I had a plumbing. You had a home. I you had, had a water. Floor. I had a blanket on me. <laughs> I had a couch. Who was sleeping? No one. My husband was at work. What? But you had a husband. I had a husband. I had a husband. There's I, no reason to throw it in people's face. <laughs> 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 Who in their vision had police? Okay. So we named some of the things that we need to put in communities to keep people safe. Food, 
family, right? A husband who is here and available and not incarcerated, right? A home, laughter, you had joy. My memory is always with my grandma, right? And I'm laying like on her side meat. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Side meat, right? And she smells so good. And there's something cooking, right? My grandfather's sitting in his chair. He's retired. We ain't got to worry about nothing. And there were no cops. So how do we invest in those actual things that keep us safe? and make sure that they're available to everybody. Who thinks that it would be dope to build a world like that? Raise your hand. Guess what? Congratulations. You are all prison abolitionists. Give yourselves a hand. All right. So I'm actually going to wrap this up uh, because it's like 6.30 and I got to eat around this time. <laughs> this ain't going to but what I want you to take away from this conversation, don't be afraid to, number one, shout the fuck out who you are. Don't ever stand for the erasure of your identity. Because when you take that risk and you shout out who you are, when you feel like, I can't do this by myself, there's going to be somebody in the room that says, I want to build that room. And you will be powerful, right? So right now, all of y'all got to do whatever happens. But hopefully you could use this class to align your collective vision and figure out how you want to move together. Cool? All right. Bye. So before I leave, on May 6th, so we'll be having an action. All right. Check out our website, Don't Do It Tonight. I ain't been updated since January. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> to get more information or join our mailing list at soulinchicago.org. Cool? Thank y'all. Thank you, Tony. All right, class, we're going to thank our guests for joining us. And it looks like we, we can take a little break. Our second speaker isn't here quite yet, so we're going to start at 645.